For the second cold season now, we've been struggling with condensation on the inside of the windows in our home. Whenever outside night temperatures fall below 10 degrees, the windows almost literally start to cry. This usually starts in mid-autumn and continues to mid-spring, when the temperatures are finally rising up. The physics behind this dew is very simple. Air can hold moisture. The hotter the air, the more moisture it can hold. However, when the air is cooled and the temperature drops, the air cannot hold the moisture anymore and water vapor becomes liquid water. This is called condensation and in a house it will happen on cold surfaces, for example your cold water supply or windows, since windows are probably the coolest surface in your house. In a typical home the air will become moist because of many factors, for example cooking or taking a hot shower or drying your laundry or even just breathing because you breathe out moist air. The common example is the mirror in your bathroom, which gets fogged when you take a shower. There is usually lots of vapor in the air when you take a shower, and since the glass of the mirror is the coldest surface, the water condensates on the mirror and that's why it becomes fogged. The problem is there is a constant damp area somewhere in your house, and given that you have heating and the air is warm enough, those damp areas are known to attract mold and black mold may start growing on your windows. Black mold not only causes damages to surfaces, especially to paper and paint, but is also known to cause quite a lot of health issues. Well, of course you can air your room, that will remove the moisture to some extent, however, this will also cool your home. So if you pay for heating, you will be paying for heating up the street outside your house. You can also mop your windows, but you will have to do this at least two or three times a day. You can also use a number of chemicals to fight the black mold, but all of this is treating the symptoms instead of treating the cause. The cause of the issue with moisture is bad airflow. Every house must have an air intake, ideally a vent in the wall, but in some cases you can have vents on the windows or even the gap under your front door can, in some cases, provide sufficient airflow inside your home. Apart from the air intake, you should also have air exhaust. In many homes, it's a ventilation pipe from the ceiling to the roof. The longer is the pipe and the higher is its top, the more pressure difference you get and the better it will work. If the height is not sufficient, or in some very damp places like kitchens and bathrooms, usually an extraction fan is installed to help push the air through the pipe and outside your home. In most cases, this also extracts the heat from inside your home and again, you're heating the street. However, those heat losses are minimal and you need to air your rooms anyway. And all of this also need maintenance. For example, most vents, both intake and outtake, will have a, some kind of a mesh filter to stop debris from coming in and if this filter is even slightly dusty, the mesh becomes completely impenetrable for air. That's why you need to clean those filters very often. With all that said, in some buildings and in some climates, no matter how good your ventilation system is, you will still end up with condensation, at least on your windows. A common example may be very old homes, which were built with no consideration about ventilation whatsoever and modern homes as well, especially those that have floor-to-ceiling windows. Floor-to-ceiling windows must have an in-floor convector heating element under them, so it will blow hot air onto the window, or the room should use air heating. And if a room with floor-to-ceiling glazing is using conventional radiators, which are not under the window, such windows will not receive enough heat and water vapor will condense on them to liquid water. This even happens on smaller windows with a radiator under them if those windows have a very deep window seal which prevents hot air reaching the glass. I struggled with mopping and swearing every time I saw dew on the windows for the first autumn winter season and the next season I caved in and purchased this. This is a dehumidifier. Apart from poorly engineered buildings, there are also some regions 
for example Asia and even some parts of Europe where the air is very humid and the winters are mild so the temperatures never go below zero and that's why the humidity is always there in the air. So this dehumidifier device is the opposite to a humidifier. Ironically, humidifiers are also used during winter seasons in places with cold winters. Since whenever temperature drops below zero, all the humidity in the air condenses and falls to the ground as rain or snow, making the air very dry. So you need a humidifier to get a little bit moisture in the air so you could breathe easily and feel better. The reason I waited for so long to buy this is the cost. Not the cost of the unit itself, dehumidifiers are relatively cheap devices, but the cost of actually running it, since obviously it uses electricity and should be on for prolonged periods of time. On the other hand, a dehumidifier is a heat pump. And a heat pump is the closest we have gotten to free energy at this point in history, since most heat pumps produce more heat or cold than the energy used. Usually for one watt of power consumed, a heat pump produces 5 or even 7 watts of cooling or heating. The dehumidifier closest relative is probably a portable air conditioner. However, air conditioning, fridge or freezer, water cooler, air-to-air -air heat pumps and many other devices use the same principle to generate heat or cold and that principle is refrigeration cycle. I will not go into too much detail while explaining how it works, and I will use a refrigerator to explain it. So basically, what is not so intuitive to understand is that temperature difference is still heat, that is still energy. For example, minus 40 and minus 10 are both cold, however, minus 10 is 30 degrees warmer than minus 40. That means you have 30 degrees of heating. And if you find a way to transfer those 30 degrees into a room, you can heat the room. This is exactly what a heat pump does. It transfers heat energy from one place to another, causing one place to become colder and the other place to become warmer. So if it's minus 10 outside and you want to have plus 20 inside your home, you need 30 degrees of heat and it doesn't really matter if you have something at plus 20 degrees and freeze it to minus 10, or you have something at minus 10 and drop it to minus 40, it is still 30 degrees of energy that could be transferred to heat the room. The reason why it is free energy is that it doesn't use the electrical power to actually heat anything. It uses the electrical power to transfer already existing heat. That means it doesn't waste power on heat generation. In a refrigeration cycle, this is achieved using special gases, which are called refrigeration agents. The most ill-known is Freon, which has been banned and not in use for a few decades now, since it was known to cause ozone layer damage in the Earth's atmosphere. And nowadays, less harmful gases are used, but the way they work is the same. If you ever passed near a fountain, a pool, a lake, or any body of water on a hot day, you have probably noticed that it is much cooler near the water. The reason for this is turning water into vapor, which is vaporization, requires power. And when the surface of water converts into vapor on a hot day, this vapor takes energy from the air around it to actually be able to vaporize. That's why the air around water becomes cooler on a hot day. Refrigerant gases are only gases at normal pressure. And that is because their boiling point, that is when a liquid becomes gas, at normal pressure is way below zero degrees. For example, at normal pressure, HFC 134A, which is a commonly used refrigerant agent, has a boiling point of minus 25 degrees Celsius. That means that if you want to convert HFC 134A from gas to liquid, you need to cool it below minus 25 degrees. Then it will become a liquid. But that is at normal pressure. However, if you pressurize this gas 
to around 6 atmospheres, which is 6 times the normal atmospheric pressure. Its boiling point will become much higher, at plus 20 degrees Celsius. That gives a temperature difference of 45 degrees, which can be transferred in the room to heat it or out of the room to cool it. So if it's minus 20 degrees outside, you can heat a room inside to up to 25 degrees Celsius. If you reverse the cycle, you can transfer heat from inside the room to the outside using the same principle. So how it works in a common kitchen refrigerator is that there is a compressor which increases the pressure of the refrigerant agent, for example, to six atmospheres until its boiling point reaches plus 25 degrees Celsius. It then passes through the so-called condenser, which is a series of tubes with fins outside the refrigerator, where it loses some of the energy while keeping the pressure and the hot gas becomes very hot liquid. Then it passes through an expansion valve, which dramatically drops the pressure from six atmospheres to around one atmosphere. This sudden drop of pressure moves the boiling point from plus 20 degrees back to minus 25 degrees, and this cool but still liquid refrigerant agent enters the inside of the fridge into the so-called evaporator. And since it's not longer pressurized, the liquid refrigerant agent starts to boil. However, in order for it to boil, to become gas again, it needs energy, since boiling uses energy. And the only way for this still liquid refrigerant agent to get energy is from the air around it. That means from the air inside the tightly sealed fridge. So it takes heat from inside the fridge to become gas again. And then this gas goes back to the compressor and the cycle repeats itself. That is how a refrigerator moves the heat away from inside the refrigerator to the outside. The reason I'm explaining the humidifier based on a fridge is that you have probably seen running water droplets, or sometimes even ice, on the back wall inside a freezer. This is water vapor that was in the air, but it has condensed to water as soon as it entered the fridge and hit the coolest part of your fridge, which is usually the back wall inside it. This condensed water usually flows down where it is collected in a drainage hole, and this drainage hole has a hose that goes to the outside of the fridge and lands in a small tray on top of the compressor where it evaporates using the heat which is generated by the compressor while it works. And this portable dehumidifier uses the same principle, with only difference being that collecting moisture from air is its only use, while in a fridge it's more of a nuisance and inconvenience than a proper function. Moreover, in a poorly designed or poorly maintained fridge or freezer, this condensation may lead to a serious problem where a huge block of ice or snow forms on the back wall inside the fridge. So this short and clumsy explanation was required to understand what we are looking at, and now let's proceed to look inside the box. The device is quite heavy, it weighs about 12 kilograms. The brand is Woods, and they pose as a Swedish company, however, if you are considering getting a dehumidifier for yourself, don't put too much attention to the brand. I have looked into several of them from different brands and came to the conclusion that most of them are produced by some OEM manufacturers in China who snap the brand name of whoever paid for it. So don't be too obsessed with the brand name. Inside there is a hose, I will talk about that in a bit, and the device itself. Nothing more. The device comes pre-assembled, it doesn't require any connections except a wall plug, and you can be set and running literally in minutes. The outer case is made entirely of plastic, the plastic is white and has a glossy finish. On one hand it's less prone to UV light, so it should resist yellowing for longer. On the other hand, glossy plastic is too easy to scratch. Even wiping it with dry cloth may leave hairline scratches. In fact, I scratched mine on the very first day of use, so yeah. Anyway, it also has a swing handle, and the back of the handle looks a bit cheap, almost as a cheap plastic bucket. However, it does the job. The handle is obviously used to lock this around, and the device also has very small wheels. 
The wheels are plastic, so they probably won't scratch your flooring, however they only rotate in one plane, from left to right. They don't swing. Which is again a minor inconvenience, since even though the device is quite heavy, you can still lift it with no problem. On the back of the device there's also an air filter, which is a simple fine mesh. You can remove the entire frame to clean it, and I would suggest cleaning it often, since as I already said, as soon as it becomes half clogged with dust and debris, not even fully clogged, just half clogged, it is already completely blocking the air. So I would suggest to vacuum it or just put under water quite often to make sure it doesn't have dust on it. And actually when you remove the filter, you can have a peep of how this device is made. And the quality is okay. On the inside you can see some bent fins on the radiator or evaporator while it was installed, some plastic cable ties holding what seems to be wires to the radiator pipes, but that is what you see on most refrigerators and air conditioners, so no big deal. And obviously these components are not exposed, they are hidden well inside the housing and there is no way they are visible from the outside. The back of the device has a sticker with some technical information. This particular model is capable of removing 10 liters of moisture, that is 10 liters of water, a day from air which is at 30 degrees Celsius with relative humidity of 80%. It will also consume 200 watts of power when the air is at 35 degrees with relative humidity of 90%. So each hour it will consume 200 watts, which is one fifth of a kilowatt, and that's how you can calculate how much it will cost you to run this unit. For example, the average price for one kilowatt an hour of electricity in Europe is around 18 euro cents. Every hour this device consumes one fifth of a kilowatt, that means that it will cost about 4 euro cents to run it for an hour. The sticker also mentions the refrigerant gas that I was talking about, in this case it's R290, which is a relatively recent invention and it is considered to be environmentally safe. It also mentions the power rating, this device can only operate on a 220 to 240 voltage socket, which covers most of Europe, most of XUSSR and a big chunk of Asia, and it only comes with Euro plug. So if your socket has a different shape, you will probably need to use an adapter. Above the sticker, there is a plug that covers the condensation exhaust port. This is very similar to the window mounted air conditioners and split system air conditioners where you need to run a hose that will handle the condensation that occurs on the inside part of the air conditioner. In fact, if you already have an air conditioner installed, or better yet, HVAC system, it usually already has a dehumidifier mode, and you may not need a separate device to remove moisture from inside your house. So this port is where you attach that hose that was in the box, However, you don't have to, since at the bottom of the device there is a tank that collects 2 liters, actually a little bit over 2 liters of water. You don't have to worry if it becomes full, since inside the tank there is a very simple floater made of styrofoam actually, with the magnet inside, and when the tank is full, this floater raises up and turns off a magnetic switch. This will turn off the device and you will not be able to turn it on, until you empty the tank. It will also not run without a tank. On top of the device there is a cover which also acts as a deflector. Unlike indoor air conditioner split systems that usually swing the deflector automatically, here you will have to open and close it manually. And you will also have to manually adjust the cover to desired angle. Also on top there is a control panel. This device doesn't come with a remote, so you will have to press buttons on the device. These look like touch buttons, but actually these are real physical buttons covered with some type of plastic resin or whatever to protect them from moisture. I really appreciate that there is no bright blue digits here, and no blue LEDs at all, and no super bright LEDs. The LEDs are quite dim, they are green in color, and they don't illuminate the whole room at night.
There are a few buttons and indicators, for example it indicates when the tank is full, it also indicates if it has entered a defrost cycle, there is obviously an on-off button, and two buttons, one of which controls the timer, so you can set up the timer when the device switches off, and you can also set up the humidity level when the device switches off, and presumably switches back on when the humidity level in the air raises above the desired selection. So probably you can just select whatever you need for this dehumidifier to enter automatic mode and, for example, go to sleep. The only problem is you wouldn't really be able to sleep next to this device since it's quite noisy. I'll try to show you an example how loud it is. Maybe some people are able to sleep while this thing is on, but not me. But anyway, this device is a miracle. It completely solved my do problem. What I do is, in the evening, after we finish the cooking and everyone has went to the shower, I turn it on and leave it on for about two hours, and that collects all the moisture from the air. There is no more condensation on my windows and I was finally able to clean them with those chemicals to remove the mold, and since then they remain clean and mold-free. Every day it collects about this amount of water. If it's a laundry day and we air our wet laundry inside, I put it next to it and leave it till morning. In the morning the tank is almost full and the laundry is almost completely dry. The collected water is actually perfect for watering house plants. In fact, there are machines that are used in uh, usually humid climates, but sometimes they are used at convention centers, for example, that use electricity to produce drinking water from air. In sunny countries, renewable electricity like solar panels can be used for that, and they also filter the water, so basically, using the same condensation cycle, and free solar energy, you get a practically endless supply of potable water. And also I found a very untraditional use for this dehumidifier. If you ever accidentally drop, for example, your smartphone in water, you can try to save your phone from water damage, especially from water corrosion, using this dehumidifier. Just take the phone out of the water, switch it off immediately, take out the SIM card tray, shake off the water as good as you can, and then leave the phone pressed against the intake of the dehumidifier for a couple hours. It should suck out the moisture even from behind the screen. If you also suffer from this humidity problem, you should invest in a dehumidifier. It will solve the issue. So far I used it in small rooms only, up to 15, maybe 20 square meters, however it should work fine in larger rooms, but maybe not as effective. But again, this is only one model. More powerful models, even in the woods range, exist, which are capable of dehumidifying larger rooms more effectively. I am the god of YouTube. Like, subscribe, thanks. Jingle bells.